Hey guys, so today we're going to be looking at some of the different events that led to the American Revolution uh, and kind of what their importance was to the war in general. Uh, so you should have a sheet that looks a little bit like this. It says Revolutionary War event chart at the top. The events are listed down the left. Um, it says date, what happened, significance. Uh, please make sure that it is double sided. You should have two sides of this. Uh, so that's where we are today. So. What we're going to be looking at here is a bunch of different events that really played an important role to the war overall. There's a lot of events I could choose from from this, but really I tried to select the ones that are the most significant turning points, that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of to what to keep your mind on today. And the way I'm going to help you remember all of these is before each slide where we talk about the event, there's some sort of like picture or visual representation um, that looks at each one of the events. So that is there to kind of help you remember it. We'll analyze each of them as we go along. So they're just as important as the events themselves. So make sure you're paying close attention to those. Uh, so I will go ahead and put on my tri-cornered hat and we will get started. <laughs> Right, so this first event is the Boston Massacre. And if you look at this representation here, this was an engraving done by Paul Revere, uh, who was a very prominent citizen at the time. And so let's look at how he depicts this event. Um, so if you look at the soldiers, they look pretty severe, uh, very calm, very casual, but firing into the crowd. It's kind of scary with all the smoke. If you look just above their heads, you'll notice it says Butcher's Hall. That's not because there was a butcher right there, but that's actually him calling the soldiers butchers. If you look at the civilians, um, they're very frightened looking. Many of them are dead or bleeding. They look very scared, uh, very innocent in this situation. And this was very much propaganda for the event at the time. And let's talk about why it was so important for Paul Revere to have this propaganda. Uh, so the massacre itself took place in March of 1770. Uh, it took place at night it was cold, it had been snowing. If you've ever been to Massachusetts, you know that in March it is still very cold. Um, and Boston at this point was an occupied city. Uh, and as you can imagine, the soldiers were very unpopular with the citizens of Boston. And so there were a group of men who, when they had gotten off of work at the harbor, decided that they were gonna be going, they were gonna go and kind of mess with some of the British soldiers that were there. So this is a group of men who were guarding the Customs House. And the Customs House is kind of like where the treasury of the city was. So these colonists go up and they start shouting really nasty things at these guys. Some of them are throwing snowballs. Some of them start throwing rocks or other things that they just find around. And we don't know exactly what happened or why it happened, but one of the British uh, muskets discharged. Whether he intentionally did it or whether it was an accident, we don't really know. But after he did that, because of all this increasing tension, the other soldiers fire on the crowd thinking that they are in danger. So as you can imagine, um, this was a very chaotic scene. Six men are killed, uh, including one man named Crispus Attucks, who was an escaped slave. Um, that's a name you may hear again. Uh, and it caused outcry all throughout uh, Massachusetts. And these men were immediately arrested and put on trial. And you might guess that they had a hard time getting a fair trial because the people of Massachusetts were so upset by what had happened. But in fact, um, a very well-known lawyer at the time, John Adams, defends the soldiers, even though he himself is a loyal patriot. Um, and they are found not guilty. Only one of the men is uh, found guilty, and that is the man who discharged first. And for the most part, it was proven that it was self-defense, um, despite how Paul Revere might have it believe. Uh, the real significance of this event is this is the first act of violence against the colonists. Uh, and of course, it does inspire a huge amount of anti-British feeling in Massachusetts, but throughout as well. Um, it's not just in Massachusetts where this is a big deal. But this is very early in this time period. Tensions are rising, but they don't really get to a breaking point until 1773 with the Boston Tea Party. Um, so if you look at this painting here, a couple things I just want to point out. You see there's a couple different ships um, as men are tossing their crates overboard. 
You'll notice that most of these men are dressed up as Native Americans. That's actually um, a disguise. They are not Native Americans. Uh, they just thought that they might get away with it if they dressed up as Native Americans. Um, and you notice that the men on the pier are waving and cheering and tossing their hats in the air. They're really excited by this. Um, so what's this all about? Well, basically, in December of 1773, just after the Tea Act had been passed, the citizens of Boston decide that they want to protest this. Um, and there's a group known as the Sons of Liberty. Uh, They're led by a guy named Samuel Adams. Uh, he is actually the cousin of John Adams. And the Sons of Liberty is a group of men who are intent on fighting against some of the British taxes that have been past. Uh, Paul Revere is in the Sons of Liberty, John Hancock, some of these other really big names that you've heard before. And the Sons of Liberty decide that they want to lead this protest against the Tea, ta the tea Act. So remember, the Tea Act is not a um, tax, right? Uh, you don't need to write the word British there. That's a typo. Uh, but the Tea Act was for the benefit of the British East India Company, uh, and the colonists kind of saw it as a way of Britain controlling the things that they purchased. And so what they did was the Sons of Liberty dressed up as Mohawk Indians. Again, you can see it in that bottom picture. They board the ships in Boston Harbor and dump about 300 chests, 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. At the time, it was worth about 9,000 pounds. In today's money, that's approximately a million dollars. This is a ton of tea. It actually turned Boston Harbor brown, like a giant pot of tea. And as you can imagine, the colonists are really excited about this. This is actually sparks other so-called Tea Party protest, one in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, led by women. However, Britain is furious, and Britain cracks down on the state of Massachusetts, or the colony of Massachusetts, by passing the Coercive, also known as the Intolerable Acts. So the Coercive Acts get rid of the um, government of Massachusetts, they get rid of the judicial system, they close up Boston Harbor, basically cutting off all of the merchants um, and anybody who depends on the harbor. And this is a major deal um, because this is really the first time that Britain has acted tyrannical. So tyrannical means like a tyrant, right? You've heard that word before, it's a dictator. Uh, this is the first time that's really happened. And so the significance here is that it really is going to encourage further rebellion and really encourage a lot of people that Britain's probably not the way they want to go. Okay, uh, so that is the Boston Tea Party. Uh, next, we have the Midnight Rides. So the Midnight Rides happened just after this in April. Okay, so at this point, Britain has been cracking down a lot on the colonies. Um, in, in April of 1775, uh, the people of Boston hear a rumor that British troops are coming in to empty out the armory. Okay, so let me kind of explain how the military worked. Uh, in colonial America. So every colony had a militia that was made up of just average citizens, okay? So the militia's job was if the colony was in danger, whether from native attacks or Spanish or whoever, um, the men of the colony would go to the armory, they would get weapons provided for them by the colony, and they would go fight and then go back to their farms. Um, they were also known as the Minutemen because they had to be ready at a moment's notice or a minute's notice. Uh, and the armory is the colonist's supply of weapons. So the British landing in Massachusetts to empty out the armory is basically the British saying, we don't want you to be able to defend yourselves. That's a huge deal, okay? So the British are, um, they know they're coming, but they don't know if they're coming by land or by sea. They don't know if they're gonna sail into the harbor or if they're gonna march in by land. So what the Sons of Liberty does is they set up a trap, essentially. So the Sons of Liberty send three men, Paul Revere, Samuel Prescott, and Richard Dawes, in order to warn the colonists. But they want to be able to get a full picture. So here's what they do. They put some men on lookout, right? And the deal is they're going to signal um, Revere and Prescott and Dawes to let them know how the British are going to come. All right. And so they said, what we'll do is we'll hang lanterns into the steeple of Old North Church when we see the British. If they're marching on land, we'll hang up one lantern. If they're marching by sea um, or if they're coming in by sea, we'll hang up two lanterns. So sure enough, the British were sailing into the harbor. Two lanterns went up and immediately Revere and Dawes head off 
Um, they meet up with Prescott and join Prescott. Um, Revere and Dawes head up to uh, Lexington and Prescott runs off to Concord to let them know. Um, Revere is actually stopped and almost captured at one point, um, but he is let go. Uh, we often think of this as just being Paul Revere. It wasn't just Paul Revere. There were a lot of people involved in this, uh, and I think that that's important to make sure you keep in mind. So the significance here is that this is successful. The Midnight Rides successfully warn Massachusetts of the British plan, and it's going to lead to the skirmishes at Lexington and Concord where the Americans are able to get their weapons before the British get there and hold them off, okay? So this map here just kind of shows you the process which they do. Um, so you see the guys in the boats in the harbor. Uh, so just kind of imagine, right, like they're sitting in the harbor. They're waiting to see how the British are going to get there, right? It's a cold, lonely night. And then all of a sudden, they see they're coming by sea. Two lanterns go up. Prescott and, or Dawes and Revere head off. Paul Revere lets Prescott know and then goes off to Lexington himself. Um, and by the time they get to Lexington, everybody knows the militia is ready to go. And this is going to lead to the shot heard around the world. Now the ride of Paul Revere set the nation on its ear. And the shot that Lexington heard round the world. When the British fired in the early dawn, the war of independence had begun. The die was cast, the rebel flag unfurled. And on to Concord marched the foe to seize the arsenal. There you know, waking folks searching all around. Till our militia stopped them in their tracks. At the old North Bridge, we turned them back and chased those red coats back to Boston town. And the shot around the world was the start of the revolution. The men and men were ready on the move. Take your power, take your gun, report to General Washington. Hurry, men, there's not an hour to lose. All right, um, so you can see here from this picture, the um, Old North Bridge is the bridge that was mentioned in the um, Schoolhouse Rock song that we just listened to here, where the militia are basically able to get to the British before they march into Concord to seize the arsenal. Um, so this happens the next day after the Midnight Rides, April 19th, 1775. The colonial, the colonial militia empties out the armory and meet the British troops at Lexington. Um, General Gage is the leader of the American troops. He had served in the British Army, um, but he has decided to support the Americans in this sense. Um, the American soldiers are able to fight the soldiers back uh, at the Old North Bridge, as it said, and they are victorious. This is a huge deal, huge, huge deal. There's two significant factors that come out of this. Um, one is that this is a huge morale booster for the Americans, right? So think about, you know, they're fighting the British Army. They don't know if they can do it. Well, this is the very first battle of the war, and the Americans are able to cut the British off in their tracks, fight them back, and win. This is huge, right? This is insane, and it's going to gain the Patriot troops a lot of support. Um, the other big he deal here is that this is obviously the first battle of the American Revolution. So keep this in mind. First battle of the American Revolution. We have not yet declared independence. That's not going to happen until 1776. Um, so it's not going to happen until about six months later or almost a year later. Uh, so this is a really big deal. And a lot of times I don't think we think about the war starting this early, but it does. Um, so this is going to eventually lead to the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, so Bunker Hill is a strategic point just outside of Boston. Uh, so that's where we're going to pick up with the next battle. So just imagine you can hear the British marching in. All right, so the Battle of Bunker Hill takes place in June, um, just after the um, War has really begun, um, June 17th, 1775. Uh, the British had taken control of Boston. Boston was occupied, remember. And the Americans want to try and regain control of that. Um, so in order to maintain control, they take a hill known as Breed's Hill, and they try to fight off the British troops. So the British are on Bunker Hill, and the Americans are on Breed's Hill. And they're trying to basically see who's going to control the next hill. Um, now, technically, the Americans lose this battle. 
However, they fight so hard and so many British are killed that even though they still don't have control of Boston, it's still seen as a moral victory. The other significant factor here is that Great Britain actually starts to take this war a little bit seriously. So before, this was just like rebels, right? We could put down and crush the rebels and go back to the way things were. What the British see after the Battle of Bunker Hill is it's not going to be that easy. And this is more than just some isolated rebels here and there. This is a united front, okay? And this is something that's gonna start spreading. So before they had just seen it as a teeny tiny little revolution that we can crush really quickly. Now they realize it's gonna be a lot more than that. Uh, so one of the first steps that the Americans want to do is take control of Canada. Oh, almost forgot. Um, so this is where this famous phrase, Prescott, um, William Prescott, who was a colonel, he famously says, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. So basically they're trying to save ammunition and um, they are worried that they're gonna run out. So Prescott says, hold off, wait till you can see how close they are, right? And so this is just kind of letting you know like how intense this battle is. Uh, so moving on. So as I said, one of the first things that the Americans are gonna try to do is maintain control of Canada. Um, so you see here, um, we have the Battle of Quebec. So the first thing that should be obvious to you in this picture is that it is winter and it is Canada. So it is cold, right? So the Battle of Quebec uh, is very early in the war uh, in December of 1775. And basically what the colonists are hoping is that they can get Canada on their side. Right. So think about, you know, Canada is also a colony of the British. Maybe the Canadians want to declare independence, too. We can have a united front. Right. Maybe we can be one big country. So they're going to try and take Canada away from British control. What they don't expect is that the Canadians are actually really not keen on this idea. Um, they are the Americans lead an attack by three men, uh, Montgomery Morgan and a guy named Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was trained under George Washington. Um, he is very loyal to the Patriots at this time, and he becomes kind of the hero of Quebec. Uh, however, think about our country today. Do we own Canada? No, we do not. Um, Great Britain crushes the colonists here. This is the first really major loss. Um, so this really kind of gives up any American hope of invading Canada. That's kind of the significance here, where maybe we, we kind of figure, maybe we should like focus on our stuff instead of the other stuff, right? So the Americans kind of turn tail and head back to New York. So New York is also controlled at this time uh, by the British. And so George Washington's first really big commission is he wants to take New York away from British control. So this is gonna lead to the Battle of Triton um, and the crossing of the Delaware River. All right, so this is a pretty famous painting of the crossing of the Delaware. Um, this is a very, very, um, romanticized painting. If you look at the way Washington looks in this painting, you know, it's very majestic. Uh, the crossing of the Delaware was a lot more intense than this. Um, so the Delaware River is in New Jersey. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, it takes place on December 26, 1775. And look at that date. Okay, the 26th, the day after Christmas. Basically, what Washington does here is he leads a surprise attack. You're not really supposed to fight on Christmas, right? So George Washington realizes that if he launches an attack on Christmas, the British are not going to expect it. Particularly, he's launching an attack on a group known as the Hessians. The Hessians, which you might want to write down um, next in German, are basically hired soldiers. The British hired these groups. Um, Hessian is spelled H-E-S-S-I-A-N. Um, so the Hessians are German soldiers that have been hired by the British. And it's night, right? They're crossing the Delaware in secret. The Hessians have been kind of partying a little bit. Maybe they're a little tipsy. Uh, and they're not expecting an attack. Because again, you don't usually attack anybody on Christmas. Um, the winter is freezing. If you remember from that painting, there's ice all over. The conditions are pretty harsh. Um, it looks like Washington may not survive. However, it is a successful attack. Over 900 British are killed or captured, and America regains control of New York and New Jersey. This is the significance here, and it's a much needed victory. At this point, um, the war has been going on for about six months, and a lot of the men who had signed up for the army are about to uh, leave. They had a six month 
commitment to the army. And at this point, it looks like the Americans are losing. A lot of men are going to be like, I'm going to peace out and go home. After this, they decide that they're going to stay. Okay, so a lot of those troops that had been planning on um, leaving end up re-enlisting. Okay, so you might even want to add that too, is that troops start to re-enlist after the end of this battle. Um, next one, we are moving on to the back of your worksheet now, is the Battle of Bennington. Um, so this particular painting I think is really interesting. Look at this guy right here. Ho, ho! I think I see the British up yonder hill. Let's all point. Everybody is pointing. And then there's this guy at the front who's just trying to tie his shoe, right? Um, so the Battle of Bennington uh, takes place on a very important day for me on my birthday of 1777. Um, no, I was not born on that day and I was not alive then. Watch your mouths. Um, but the Battle of Bennington is a surprise raid um, by the British General Borregon, okay? So he's trying to basically cut into the south. Um, into Virginia. Bennington is in Virginia. And he thinks he's going to surprise the American troops there. However, the militia had weakened the British troops by attacking supply trains. So the Americans figured out really early on that they could not fight this war in a traditional way. So one of the things that they would do is have guerrilla militia um, attack the supply train. So any like wagons with weapons or food or whatever supplies was needed, um, they would attack these trains and they wouldn't be able to get to the British Army. Not actual trains, they are wagons, they're just called supply trains. Um, but the, by, because the militia had been attacking these supply trains, the troops are weakened by this. They don't have enough supplies. Um, also, it's not such a surprise attack. The Americans learn they're coming, they fight back. So if you think about everybody in the painting is pointing, they're pointing because they know they're there, right? It's the surprise attack. Um, but they end up defeating the British troops here. Um, this is going to really reduce the significance here is it's really going to reduce the number of Borregon's troops. He has to retreat and eventually will lead to the surrender at Saratoga. Okay, so that's going to be a um, important surrender for the Americans. So this is the, the reason this one is important is because it's directly before that. So the Battle of Saratoga is an interesting one because it is the first official surrender of the war. Um, so if you think about the fact that this war is something that Americans probably shouldn't have won at the first place, forcing any kind of surrender against the British, that's a historical exception. <laughs> Right? So a historical, or what basically happens at Saratoga is this, this is actually a series of battles from September to October of 1777. So remember just after the Battle of Bennington in August. Um, and this is General Gates versus General Borgon. Okay, so Borgon had retreated back up to Saratoga. Gates meets him there. And the colonists are using a lot of that same guerrilla warfare tactic to really weaken the British troops. And the British are going to surrender to General Gates. Now here's the deal. Another general was really, really important to Saratoga, and that general was Benedict Arnold. Um, Benedict Arnold, in the end, doesn't get a lot of the credit for what happens at Saratoga, and that's going to be part of what leads him to kind of turn coat. Um, so the significance of this uh, surrender here, the major significance, is that France is convinced to join on the American side of the war. So France had basically been on the fence about whether or not they wanted to help out the Americans. And with this first surrender of the war, the surrender of the top part of the war, so this is all of the northern army, France goes, you know what, guys? We're going to help you out. We're going to give you some money. We're going to give you some um, supplies. And we're going to send some troops to help you out and fight this war and hopefully help you win. Um, also, as I said, Benedict Arnold is going to become a traitor to the U.S. because he feels that he didn't get enough credit um, after the Battle of Saratoga. And he's probably going to be one of the most famous traitors of this war. Um, so next, we have the winter at Valley Forge. So after October, um, fighting kind of stops in the winter. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to fight in the winter, especially if you don't have a lot of supplies. So Washington's troops um, kind of end up settling. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. 
So Washington really tries to, um, ends up wintering in a place called Valley Forge, and this is going to be really hard on Washington's troops. So think about that quote that you just heard read, um, these are the times that try men's souls or that test men's souls. And look at this, this painting, the mood of this painting is very low, right? Um, the winter at Valley Forge was really harsh. So it's the winter just following the surrender at Saratoga on to the beginning of 1778. And like I said, it's where Washington's men camp for the winter. Um, they're low on supplies. The conditions are harsh. A lot of the men don't have shoes or decent clothing. Disease spreads, smallpox spreads really quickly. Um, Washington does try inoculation here. Morale is pretty low. People feel like maybe they're not gonna win this war after all. So the morale gets pretty low. And this is a really hard time for the American troops. However, there's something really important that takes place at Valley Forge. And that's a man named, um, a Prussian man, whose last name is von Steuben, um, comes to train the men. So while they are camped out for the winter, he's training a lot of these men that did not have any sort of professional training. Um, and he brings a lot of experience to the army. So this is kind of some of the major significance here. Once Valley Forge, once the winter is over um, and the men leave Valley Forge, uh, this is going to become really important for them. Um, so again, that Steuben is, von Steuben's thing is the significance. Um, you also really should know that quote, these are the times that try men's souls. Um, Thomas Paine was a very influential author. Um, Washington would actually read um, that crisis, which was that document. Um, he would read the whole thing out to his troops to try and encourage their morale. And eventually it is going to pick the Americans back up. Um, so after the winter of Valley Forge, the men are going to continue to push south. Okay, so we've ended the northern part of the war. Now we're going to be fighting in the south. And remember, General Borregon has surrendered in the north. So now we're going to be fighting a guy named General Cornwallis in the south. Um, and so this begins with the Battle of Monmouth here. Um, so the first thing you should notice in this battle is front and center of this painting is a woman firing the cannon. <laughs> All right, this woman is Molly Pitcher, and she plays a really important role in this battle, so we'll get to her in just a second. Um, but the Battle of Monmouth takes place in June of 1778, June 28, 1778. This is the first battle fought after von Steuben's training, so it's really going to see, did he do anything for the Americans? And as we're going to see, yes, he did. And that's actually the significance of this battle. You probably want to put that in significance. Um, so the Americans at Monmouth are trying to slow the British troops as they're pushing south. Um, the battle technically ends as a draw, but what ends up happening is a lot of British desert their troops, desert the troops. They're tired of fighting at this point. The war's been going on for three years and they're done. So a lot of them end up changing sides and fighting with the Americans. Um, this battle is also significant because it gives rise to a legend of a woman nicknamed Molly Pitcher. So Molly, her last name was not actually Pitcher, but she was bringing water to the men in the battle. Her husband was fighting in the battle, and so she was bringing water to men as they were continuing to fight. And during the battle, supposedly, her husband, who was firing the cannon, is shot and is wounded. So Molly Pitcher takes over and starts firing her husband's cannon, helping um, end this battle quickly. So it's just kind of one of those fun stories that comes out of the Battle of Monmouth. Um, the next battle we have um, is a is John Paul Jones upon the Bonhomie Richard. All right, so John Paul Jones was a pirate essentially, um, and he's going to be really the only naval captain we have at this time. So the Battle of the Bonhomie Richard takes place on September twenty third of seventeen seventy nine. And John Paul Jones um, leads this naval battle off the coast of England. So America doesn't really have much of a navy, but England has a super navy, right? So basically, John Paul Jones's job is to stop the British Navy, okay? So he is leading an attack on two major British ships, um, trying to keep them from being able to come to America. Um, the battle lasts about three hours. It's pretty common for naval, ba naval battles. They're pretty long. Um, but the Bonhomie Richard sinks. However, despite the sinking of the Bonhomie Richard, Jones successfully captures the British ship, the Serapis. Um, this is the most significant naval battle of the war. That's the significance here. Um, and John Paul Jones supposedly at this battle says, I have just begun to fight. Like even when it, his ship, the Richard, has sunk and it seems like he's at the end, I have just begun to fight, right? So I'm going to keep going. And even though he doesn't 
technically win the battle, it's still a pretty important um, capture of the Serapis here. So next, um, we have the Battle of Camden. Um, so you'll notice down here at the bottom, this poor guy, he looks like he's gonna be hurting tomorrow. Um, if he's not dead. Um, but the Battle of Camden takes place again on my birthday, a lot of important battles on my birthday, on August 16th, 1780. And this is uh, one of the first major, major battles fought in the South. Um, this is General Gates versus Lord Cornwallis, who is the British general in the, for the Southern Army. And the Battle of Camden was an attempt to keep um, Cornwallis from pushing upwards. He was trying to basically conquer the South. Um, the British um, are able to defeat the militia. The militia is kind of the core of this battle here. Um, and the militia does retreat and many are killed. Um, it is a defeat of the Americans. And what this means is that Great Britain for the time being is gonna maintain control of South Carolina. This is a problem because South Carolina has really one of the only major ports in the South, the port of Charleston. So as long as Cornwallis is controlling South Carolina, he's probably going to be able to control a lot of what comes in and goes out of the South. Um, this is um, the also where Cornwallis is going to try and push up to control the rest of the South here. Um, so that's kind of where we end up with the Battle of Camden. So from Camden, uh, Cornwallis pushes to Guilford Courthouse. And if that sa name sounds familiar, that's because this is in Guilford County in North Carolina. <laughs> So Guilford, uh, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse is a really significant battle um, for the American troops here. Um, so it takes place in March of 1781. Uh, so like I said, it's as Cornwallis is continuing to push up. Um, this is fought between a man named Nathaniel Green, who is another major officer in the uh, Patriot Army. And this is America's attempt really to keep hold of the South. Um, unfortunately for the Americans, uh, the Continental or the Cornwallis's army is really just too powerful, um, especially for the combination of mostly militia. Um, the other really important thing to understand here is that a lot of North Carolina was actually loyal to the British. So they weren't getting a whole lot of help from the people in North Carolina. Um, so this battle, in this battle, the American army keeps retreating. However, as they keep retreating, they're still like stopping, killing a bunch of British, and then backing up, and then stopping and killing a bunch of British, and then backing up, till eventually they hit the courthouse. Um, technically, this is the significance, technically Great Britain wins this battle. However, they lose so many men that famously Lord Cordwallis said, another such victory will lose us this war. So if we um, lose this many men in another battle, we're going to lose this war. Uh, and that's pretty much exactly what happens. So it's seen as a victory for America. Um, Lord Cornwallis at the end is gonna kind of surround North Carolina and move up to Yorktown. So Yorktown is in Virginia, okay? So at Yorktown, uh, the British camp out, you can see in the red in this picture, represents the British here. So the British camp out just up against the harbor at Yorktown. Um, and then on October 19th of 1781, um, this battle really begins where the Americans come in from the front and the side. So if you look here, that's the Americans and these are the Americans back here. Then the French pull up into the harbor here. So the French send their ships into the harbor. Okay, so what this is going to do is basically surround the British. So Cornwallis has no choice but to surrender this battle. Okay, um, so outnumbered, Cornwallis surrenders to George Washington. And this is going to be the last battle of the war. And it is, of course, an American victory. Um, so at the Battle of Yorktown, we have the end of the war and America has won. <laughs> Um, so, of course, a victory, a surrender at Yorktown isn't going to be the official end. The war has to end with a treaty. So it ends with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Um, this is going to be the official end of the war. Um, and what's really important about the Treaty of Paris is that Great Britain recognizes America as a new country. Um, this is Great Britain saying, we surrender 
to you guys. We are giving up. We see that you are your own country. This is huge. Great Britain was the most powerful military in the world, and they are surrendering to a colony, right? Nothing like this had ever happened in the world. And when we call this the shot heard around the world, it's not just, you know, a physical shot that everyone can hear, but it's going to go on to influence France, Ireland, Latin America, all of these other countries to rebel against their colonial masters. Um, so this is a really important war and a really important significance. So I know that was a lot of information to throw at you. Uh, I hope you got it all down. I will see you guys in class.